Good evening, everyone. I'm just letting people come in from the waiting room. We have a big list tonight. Um, uh, I hope this doesn't break my Zoom account. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, So let me introduce myself and we'll get a little started. We'll do some housekeeping while uh, people get settled in. I'm Debbie Schwartz, founder of Road to College and the Paying for College 101 Facebook group. And I am here tonight with Jeff Salingo and, Salingo and Matt Siegelman. Um, and we're going to talk about college majors and when and why a college major actually matters. Um, before I want to formally introduce Jeff and Matt, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping for everybody who's on the call tonight. Uh, this is actually technically a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar. And I only tell that to people so that um, if you can keep your audio muted, um, it's up to you for whether or not you want to put your video on. It's, sometimes it's nice to see people's face, but it's up to you. And um, let me uh, check the chat. Uh, you can put questions into the chat. Uh, I will look at the chat. You know, if it's appropriate, I'll, I'll um, ask the question while we're talking. But otherwise, we'll probably do a lot of Q&As at the end. Uh, this is a, this will be recorded. You'll, you'll receive the link tomorrow. And the last little piece of housekeeping is I'd love to know who's here tonight. If you want to share in the chat, um, if you're a parent, if you're a professional, you could be both a parent and professional in higher ed. And uh, because we sent this invitation out to people who have uh, high school students and college students, I'd love if your student is in high school, let us know. If your student is in college, let us know. And the last piece, and this is up to you because we're talking about majors, if your student has chosen a major and what that major is. So um, just gives us a little context um, as to who is uh, out here tonight. Okay, so let's um, officially get going. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation with Matt and Jeff. And actually, as I was pulling some of the information together, I said to Jeff, this is great stuff. Um, as a parent myself, um, uh, you know, it's really important to know this information. Jeff mentioned this, a lot of this is usually shared with colleges, but not, um, it doesn't always get down to the parent level. So hopefully tonight's discussion will be really helpful for parents and students. Um, so a lot of you guys know Jeff, but I will formally give his bio. Uh, Jeff has written three New York Times bestselling books. His latest book, which I'm sure a lot of people have read who are on here tonight, is called who Gets In and Why? A Year Inside College Admissions. It was named 100 Notable Books of the Year by the New York Times. And Jeff is now working on another book, which you may have heard about. Um, I don't know what the title is. I just know it's something about Plan B. But <laughs> um, And um, he's trying. the new book um, will try and expand our lens on colleges behind looking beyond looking at colleges just from a rankings perspective and really what makes a good college. Um, Jeff is also a special advisor and professor of practice at Arizona State University, and he co-hosts his own podcast called Future You, Future you and um, has a regular newsletter, which again, I'm sure many of you have um, received, and it's called Next. So thank you, Jeff. And Jeff has invited a guest, Matt Siegelman, um, who is the president of Burning Glass Institute, uh, which I want to ask Matt to share a little bit about. And he's also the chairman of Lightcast and a visiting fellow at the project at, on workforce at Harvard University. So Matt, if you can tell a little bit about what Burning Glass Institute is, because I'm sure people in the audience may not be as familiar with it. Well, first, Debbie, thank you so much for, for having me. And Jeff, always great to be together. Um, you know, the Burning Glass Institute is a nonprofit research center that um, focuses on um, tracking people's careers. So we use big data to analyze millions of people's careers and millions of job openings every day to understand um, what jobs are out there and what it takes to get them and how people reach them. Great. And I know um, a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight, you and Jeff had collaborated on, um, and I'm sure you've done other collaborations, but um, this is research and a report that you put out about a year ago. Um, so let's get started um, with questions. And um, one other thing I just want to mention uh, to people, um, I personally like frameworks. When I was going through this information, I could tell that there's definitely you know, a framework in which um, Jeff and Matt have um, presented their information. And I'm just going to give a clue to people as you listen to everything that we're talking about tonight. Keep in mind, obviously, college major. Keep in mind um, um, the college itself and the selectivity, and also 
in-demand skills. Those are three really important um, factors that uh, I think you'll kind of see them come together tonight. So to get started, um, I know in, in a lot of the stuff that I do, and I know Jeff, you know, we, we're focusing so much on cost. We're, talk, we're focusing on the cost of, of, of what a college is and helping families find affordable colleges. And you kind of think, well, once they get to college, maybe that was enough. Like, you know, I could take a breath, but the reality is that it needs to continue because we realize now that um, there is an ROI on, on a major. And um, what do you think that, um, how has that been influencing, or maybe it has or hasn't been influencing students and parents when students choose that major? Yeah, Debbie, first of all, great to be with you again, and great to be with all the folks in the Road to College community and Paying for College 101, which uh, I love. I get so many great ideas from that community. It's such a strong community. So thank you for, for being here tonight. I'm going to start to answer this, and then I'm going to ask Matt to talk a little bit about the work that they did in the UNC system, because even though it's in a one system in the University of North Carolina, I think it really shows this in a, in a much broader um, way. You know, we used to think of, of going to college as, um, you know, getting a job and learning something. But uh, since the Great Recession, if you look at a, a big survey that uh, UCLA does every year on why students go to college, uh, taken of college freshmen, you'll see starting basically in the, after the Great Recession of 2008, the number one reason to go to college was to get a job. What's interesting also as a result is that the number of majors in the humanities have dropped off dramatically um, since then. So in the last 10 years, academic fields such as philosophy, history, English have drastically declined in, in popularity. Only about 11% of bachelor's degrees awarded um, in recent years went to humanities majors, uh, down from 16% uh, a, a decade ago. Um, the most dramatic declines have been in English and in history. Um, and while the humanities majors have declined, colleges have seen dramatic increases in the number of students choosing to major in other areas, particularly um, the sciences. So engineering uh, majors, computer uh, science majors. In fact, engineering and computer science degrees have now surpassed all humanities degrees um, combined. And so what we're seeing is that uh, this ROI of the degree is really seen as the major. And I think one of the things, if, if you take anything away from tonight's conversation, as you, set, as you set this up, Debbie, it's not the major alone that really shows the ROI of the degree. In other words, you could major in what we see, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, what somebody might see as the you know, the biggest return on investment, which would be like computer science or engineering. But if you don't have the right set of skills, you may not get the right jobs that that equal that return on an investment. So I, one, one danger I see in, in focusing on the return on investment, and I get why parents and students want that, is not just to think about the major and selectivity but also skills. So Matt, I, I know that you have done a lot of work, um, particularly in the University of North Carolina system. Can you talk a little bit about some of the big findings there and how they could potentially be scaled across the, the country? In other words, what, what you found in the University of North Carolina system, I would imagine on ROI is not just um, uh, limited to that one system, but I'm assuming can be used throughout the, the country. Yeah, and that, that just happens to be a, a system where um, they recently sort of published a report on this, but work um, in, in schools across the country looking at these same sets of questions. Right. Um, so, so first of all, I, I think one of the things which is um, you know notable here is just to sort of think, how do you actually measure um, the return on investment in a degree? Um, you know, it sounds, it sounds all statistical, um, but really what this translates to is being able to track people's careers and being able to say, okay, look, um, let's ingest millions of people's resumes and LinkedIn profiles and see where are they? Where did, where did they make it to? Um, and how does that vary by what school you went to, by what major you've been in? Um, you know, here's, here's what we found in the UNC system. So first of all, it's a great system. Um, overall, most um, of their programs provided um, a really good payoff. Um, but I think there's a couple of things which I found really interesting. Um, 
all of that said, so, you know, yes, most programs are, are giving you that payoff, but the difference between the, the return on investment in the top performing uh, UNC system program and the bottom was tenfold. Um, so, you know, literally we talk about, hey, it's worth it to go to college and it is worth it to go to college. Um, there's a huge span of variance around that. Um, there's, um, and, and I think that's one of the things in general that's missing from the discussion about the value of a college degree is that we tend to traffic in averages. Um, and the reality is um, that uh, not that the college degree doesn't pay off on average, but that too few people um, achieve that average or, or, or hit above it. So that was one thing that I think was certainly very clear in the UNC system. You know, I think one of the other things which I would point out is that in any given school, and the UNC system is 16 schools from Chapel Hill down to um, uh, some, some very regional um, schools, HBCUs and others. Um, but uh, what you would find in any given school, and that includes Chapel Hill, um, that there are, um, there are shining stars um, programs of study majors that that are um, that are really leading the pack, and there are laggards. Um, you know, in in Chapel Hill, for example, where you, as you would imagine, it's an elite institution. Um, they were top of the system, and most of their programs of study. Um, but interestingly enough, their engineers um, are really actually no better than than average um, in terms of the returns they get. Now, no one's crying over them; they're getting a lifetime return on investment of something like two million dollars. Um, but that said, there are actually other schools, even in the UNC system where they could do a lot better. Um, and so that's, that's another key finding here, which is that, um, we tend to get very fixated on the label of the school. Um, but the reality is, is that, um, it's not just the, the school itself, but what you study while you're there. I'm just curious, Matt, the, um, study that you're talking about and they talk and the ROI, did they include um, um, debt and the cost of debt that students were taking on or just the pure cost of, you know, um, the, the tuition? No, so it, it does factor in um, the cost of, of the tuition, the typical debt that somebody has. Um, now, debt uh, obviously is a way of paying off the cost, um, but you also have to look at a bunch of other factors as well that people tend to, to forget about, which is um, you know, what percentage of students make it through? Um, you know, I know for a lot of the parents on this call are, are you know, by virtue of, um, of being on a call like this are, are really, you know, there with their kids and, and gonna, uh, this may not be an issue. Um, but it's always surprising to me, um, uh, you know, the percentage of students who start a college degree and don't finish. Um, and, you know, that's uh, nationally, that's that's about 40% uh, of students um, don't complete their college degree. Um, so it's close to half. Um, and uh, and those numbers can be high even in a number of schools that have pretty decent brands. And so, you know, hey, look, here's the this great payoff you get. But if only 50% of the students in that program ever actually finish the program, you kind of have to adjust downward that return on investment. And what about the trend that we're seeing um, of states and um, companies not not requiring um, a college degree anymore? And they're kind of coming out with um, you know big announcements about it. I actually saw a quote that said or a stat that um, in this coming year, close to fifty percent of companies might um, eliminate a bachelor's degree. And um, and you're talking about RRI, but in, in, like what what other um, benefits are there besides just ROI, um, you know, in terms of uh, helping students, uh, especially related to mobility? So, so first of all, um, you know, when it comes to what employers are, are saying, um, it's, it's, um, it, it's important to compare what they're, what they're doing with what they're saying. We actually have a report that's coming out next week on exactly that. And um, spoiler alert, I think what you're going to find is that um, you know, there's a there's a big gulf between policy and practice, and and um, a lot of firms that are dropping degree requirements aren't actually changing who they hire. 
But nonetheless, you know, I think your your question's a really good one because we are at this strange moment right now where there's a growing um, crisis of confidence in higher education. Um, and, you know, we, we don't need to tread into all the sort of the fireworks that have been going on um, at, at the most elite schools, but, but I think this sort of, and, and how that pans out more broadly in higher education. Um, but, um, but what you do find is, um, you know, a, a really epical change in public perception of higher education, where on the one side you've got, um, if you look at the percentage of young adults who in Gallup polls say, you know, it's very important to go to college, that was, that was about, I think, 74% 10 years ago. It's now about 40%, um, which is a huge change um, in, in how people are thinking about college. On the other hand, to your point, you've got employers saying, um, and, and often for very good reasons, right? But maybe actually we don't need to hire um, people in, in a bunch of our roles with degrees. And, but Matt, um, I, I think, you know, and I'm showing this slide from a report we did, you know, what's important about the degree is not just um, the degree, the ability to earn, but can you talk a little bit about the mobility yeah. piece here? Because I think this was an important part exactly. uh, of something that we saw in this report that we did about making the bachelor's degree more valuable was that students with or graduates with a bachelor's degree actually have more mobility in the job market. So it's not just the ability to earn, but it's also mobility. So, so glad you brought that up, right? Because look, despite that kind of um, that that crisis of confidence in both directions, um, the reality is is that the degree is valuable, and it's valuable not just um, for what you earn, but for your ability to for the agility that somebody acquires in in mapping their careers. That's especially important today because um, the job market is becoming increasingly dynamic. Um, we did some work um, two years ago together with the Boston Consulting Group where we found that the average U.S. job has seen 37% of its skills replaced in just five years. So all of us are constantly having to re, um, reinvent ourselves. Um, and people with a degree are acquiring um, not just a set of skills that they can uh, get a good return on. They're um, acquiring the sets of skills um, to acquire new skills um, and to reinvent themselves over time. So um, I hope you don't mind if I'm going to jump around a little bit, yeah. because based on what you just said, Matt, I'd love to hear a little bit more. And somebody actually I saw in the in the comments talked about and I know it's, you know, it's again in the news a lot about AI and, you know, kind of this um, what it's going to do to, you know, our students futures in the job market. And I, I imagine kind of playing up with what you just talked about, mobility, being able to kind of move um, to different types of jobs is going to be helpful. But um, you know, somebody even brought up, and I, I saw it too recently, that you know companies like Microsoft, Google just laid off you know these highly skilled um, engineers, you know um, developers, and so the, it's like, what's that? What what type of message should we, does that send? And 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 how can students kind of um, figure out? what to major in and what skills to develop so that you know the, the, they can potentially future-proof um, their jobs in the future. So uh, a couple of thoughts there. Um, so first of all, I, I wouldn't get too panicked just yet. Um, the, there are some, some big layoffs in the news, but actually kind of historically, we're at a fairly low level of, of, of layoffs. But generative AI is scary because, um, you know, look, for the first time, we're seeing automation come after the kinds of jobs that were always supposed to be safe. Mm -hmm. The kinds of jobs that our kids are getting, where, where we put all this work into getting our kids into college precisely so that they'll be safe. Um, and increasingly, those are the kinds of jobs that are going to have some, some impact. Here's what we know. Um, my um, my colleague at the Harvard Project on, on the Future of Work, David Deming, has done a bunch of great research looking at the kinds of jobs that are um, most not only valuable, but resilient. And they're the kinds of jobs that blend um, both quantitative skills and social skills. Um, and so I would take that to how you think about constructing your education as well. Um, you know, yes, um, uh, in a technical education, engineering, STEM skills um, are really valuable. 
Um, but the reality is, is that um, you need a broad set of skills um, in order to a uh, broad portfolio. We looked, um, and what you're seeing here is, is a set of um, foundational skills for 21st century work. Um, now we're used to thinking about foundational skills as either, either soft skills or it's like the really core stuff. And so then we think about the, um, you know, the three R's and those core human skills, um, you know, the kinds of things like that you're seeing on the, the top left, the soft skills, like communication and creativity and, and collaboration, um, those sets of skills are still really valuable. These are, again, the skills that if you look across jobs, what are the ones that are kind of the 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 hold the keys to to the most high value jobs? But what you're also finding is that increasingly um, everybody needs a set of digital skills, of data skills, and even business skills. Um, business skills sounds weird to say like everyone needs business skills, um, but think about something like project management. Um, you're going to need it whether you're going into tech, whether you're a nurse who increasingly has to manage care across uh, across providers. Um, and so making sure that students are filling their dance card in smart ways, that they're not- And just, Matt, I think this is an yeah. important point because you've always made this point to me is that very few majors in college, this goes back to how Debbie framed this in the beginning, right? We tend to think about the selectivity of an institution, then we think about major, and then we end our, our idea of what college is. But as you pointed out to me, if these are the foundational skills, there are very few majors in any college that actually package all of these skills together. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? And when somebody in a major where a skill is not common gets it, how much more valuable that is? You know, um, uh, let me use this example. Um, right. We all we all probably know people who work in marketing. Um, they're usually very nice people because they're right brain people and they understand people and they communicate well to people and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, increasingly today, marketing is um, is a data sport. Right. You got to be able to manipulate customer data and all that kind of stuff. Well, um if you're trying to find your friendly right brain person who can actually build a SQL database, it turns out they're really hard to find. So on the um, there's a, a reason for that. Part of it is right brain versus left brain, right brain person, left brain skills. But part of it is to Jeff, to your point, um, universities are constructed around silos. Um, we don't tend to teach the SQL skills, which would be in typically in the CS department with the marketing department, which is in the business school. Um, and so yet increasingly people need those sets of skills. So here's what, what you have to do um, to put yourself in the catbird seat in your career. You need to um, be taking stock of the kinds of jobs that you're interested in and reading, what are they asking for? And then saying, okay, how do I make sure that I'm very purposely constructing my program of study um, so that I'm building in those kinds of skills? To, to your point, Jeff, um, in any given program of study from, from the research that we did together, um, we found that um, in any given program of study, there are sets of skills that can get you paid 20, 30% more on graduation. Um, it's not about necessarily changing your major it's about making sure that you have your major plus. So what does that look like then, Matt, that major plus? So um, you, know, you, you gave the example of marketing with data analytics. Could you give, you know, and, and there's a big bump in that, but what does that require? Does that require somebody to kind of go outside of the traditional curriculum, get a certificate, take additional courses on their own. I mean, this is the thing that I don't think enough parents and students know when they send their kids off to college, that doing whatever is in the envelope of the curriculum sometimes may not be good enough. You know, so um, this can take a bunch of different forms. Um, so sometimes it can be non-departmental courses. Um, uh, sometimes it can be, um, and, and it, all the more valuable, in fact, if you can get an internship, um, that can help you exercise, um, those sets of skills in the workplace. 
Um, you know, it can be some kind of online course, um, though you have to make sure you've got a good way of signaling it. But the key thing is, um, is actually having an intentional architecture to how you're building out your, your course plan. Um, and making sure that you're picking sets of skills and picking sets of internships that are going to complement it. Um, you know, a lot of people, you mentioned at the start of the call, Jeff, that um, lots of people are fleeing liberal arts. Um, and I think that's, um, it, it's a terrible shame, first of all, for some of the reasons that we we talked about before, some of what you're showing here on this page, that actually in many cases, some of these foundational skills themselves actually pay off um, substantially and, and deliver significant wage premiums on graduation. And which means, by the way, Matt, that if your son or daughter is going to major in a liberal arts field, if they get some of these additional, some first of all, some of these foundational skills they're going to get with the liberal arts, right? Things like influencing and leadership and things like that. But for example, program management, I think is a great example, right? If you're a liberal arts major uh, or budgeting or forecasting, if you're a liberal arts major, but you take an accounting course or things like that, right? That could actually boost your earnings and boost your job prospects, even if you have a liberal arts major often dramatically and and it's not the 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 earnings numbers here um kind of understate the benefit because it's not just um how much more you make but how many more jobs are available to you um and the program management is a great example because think about what somebody might do with the liberal arts major um it might go work whether at a nonprofit or or elsewhere in 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 driving programs well um you can't do that if you haven't been trained in it so let me talk a little bit about, I, I know, Matt, we're going to let you go in a little bit, and, and Debbie and I are going to continue the conversation. But but the question I think for um, parents and students out there is, how do you get these additional skills? I'm seeing in the, in the chat, for example, you know, oh, well, we could do this through co-ops and internships. Is that really the only way? Is, you know, there's a, a number of individual courses now online that students can take outside of their college or university. How important is it to get those credentials? So I'm thinking of things like, uh, you know, a Salesforce certification or, you know, Altrix or Tableau certification. How important, so how can somebody go about this? Is it about getting a co-op Is it or an internship? Is it about getting a certification? If you were giving advice to, you know, students and parents, tonight who are going to major in X or Y, what other types of experiences do they need? What types of certifications do they need? So the key thing is making sure whether it's a certification, whether it's an internship um, or um, you know whatever other set of means that you're, you're choosing, you need to make sure this is something which is recognizable to employers. Um, minor is another great example. Um, because, you know, just taking a course, the reality is employers really don't often read your transcript. Um, taking the Coursera course or the LinkedIn um, course and something uh, may have some benefit. There's some signaling effect, but employers don't ask for um, that, that certification. So, you know, when it comes to certifications, I, wanna, I would encourage you to think of this like Meow Mix. Um, right, like you know, meow mix is so good that cats ask for it by name or whatever. It wasn't that wasn't that the slogan? <laughs> um, right, but there's actually very few certifications that employers ask for by name, and you want to figure out what those are in your field, okay. and you want to go and get those. Um, if not, you want to make sure that, um, uh, or perhaps even better, that you have an internship that says I've actually used. It's not just that I've theoretically acquired these skills, but I've used them. Um, or at minimum, you know, sort of think about a minor. Um, minors are a big commitment, but it's a good way of saying, yes, I'm a classics major, um, but I've also got a minor in statistics. I'll, I'll just share one hack as a parent to other parents um, as, and have a parent with um, having two students graduate and one still in college, that um, my students or my kids um, asked upperclassmen what their interviews were like. Because more and more employers, or I hate to use, but they're testing, you know, um, candidates. So maybe that's not a great word to, to use, but they're giving them case studies. They're giving them 
honestly, problem sets to do, um, you know, and so I think it's interesting if your students start to understand what the interview process is going to be like, they might start kind of working backwards and say, oh, I need to have that skill to be able to show it, you know, as part of the, the um, you know, problems that I might get just in the interview. Yeah, and, and Matt, before we let you go, to just build on Debbie's point there about skills, how, okay, so I, I've now picked a, um, uh, an institution. I've now picked a major. Uh, how do I know what real skills I'm going to need? Where can I get those clues? So Debbie just said, you know, ask upperclassmen who have had internships or jobs. Where else might I get clues about what types of skills I need to get the jobs I want in my field? So there's two other approaches I would suggest. Um, one um, is leverage your school, your school's alumni network, perhaps even better than, than asking upper classmen, upper classmen are more accessible perhaps, but on the other hand, alumni are always tickled to hear from students. Um, and, and so being able to say, look for alumni who are working in that field and, and ask them, um, and they're often very generous with their time. The other, and, and I, it's not an either or, I would do both of these is to read job openings. Job openings are really easy to find in today's environment. Um, and I would look what they are asking. Um, you know, we, we're used to, in the same way that, that a lot of kids want to be able to use the common app just to be able to send their application out to a whole bunch of different schools. We do the same thing with resumes. I'm going to write my resume and I'm just going to press send and I'm going to send it to a whole bunch of places, but you're missing a big opportunity if you aren't actually reading what employers are looking for and saying, how do I mirror that language? And better yet, even before you get to senior year and are starting to apply, read those jobs so you can make sure you can, um, you actually can legitimately put forward a resume that reflects that language, that reflects the skills and the credentials that the employers you're trying to land a job at are looking for. So it sounds like a lot of what we're talking about, I mean, it's also, it's important to get good internships um, so that you get exposure to um, what the job market wants and maybe can understand what what skills to develop and then seeing whether or not you can do it within your college or, you know, other other additional classes or courses you might want to supplement to increase your skill base. So it's kind of under, it's getting a good major and an expertise in a, in a topic and then expanding your skill base. Debbie, before we let Matt go, um, Matt, there's one thing I do want to ask because it came up in the comments. Somebody said, oh, this is very business focused, right? Uh, you know, I mentioned in the beginning about the huge decline in humanities majors. It always, when I talk to parents and students, it always makes me feel like everyone's majoring in STEM or business and nothing else. What What is, if, if you have, a, a, if you're on this call tonight and you want to major in the humanities, you have a kid who wants to major in the humanities, or they have no idea what they want to do. Can you give us some hope about why there is an ROI? Because we've talked about this. Why there is an ROI to somebody who doesn't major in STEM or business? So first of all, I sure hope there's an ROI because um, I've got a couple of kids oriented in that direction. And more importantly, I've got um, a wife who's a professor of classics. So um, if I don't believe in the liberal arts, I think I'm going to spend the rest of my life on the sofa. But, um, you know, um, look, um, we talked before about the agility that people acquire through liberal arts. Um, and that is um, not just theoretical. We actually see it in the data. Um, you know, when STEM majors graduate from school, it seems like a great deal. They're making about 50% more than their classmates. 10 years later, um, liberal arts students have come close to catching up with them. Um, so um, the real question with the liberal arts is that um, there's a really big range of outcomes. And so um, this is why it's so important. It's, the question is not, you know, hey, shouldn't I just major in STEM instead? First of all, STEM isn't for every kid. And second, even if it is, um, the reality is, is that, um, you know, um, it, it's, uh, that would be necessary. It's, it's a, often a mistake. There are, um, the real question is, how do you make sure you can be more confident in a good outcome from your liberal arts degree? And that's why what you brought up before, Jeff, about skills, about internships um, are so important. We know that employers are looking for the sets of skills that are core to a liberal arts education. 
Um, but they are also looking for students to come to work job ready on day one. And so we we have to stop thinking of it as an either or and start thinking of it as a both end. Um, it's important to get the liberal arts education. That's been the bedrock of America's higher ed, higher education heritage, and we should we should uh, double down on it. But we need to make sure that students know what skills to acquire. Um, and I think we've talked a little bit about some of how they can figure that out. Um, because those practical applied skills are going to boost their chances that the liberal arts degree that they get um, is going to wind up on the long haul paying off as well as a STEM degree. Um, I want to build on a little bit of that, Matt, but I really appreciate you joining us uh, tonight and, uh, and thanks for your time. Thank you very much. It was great hearing and having you. Debbie, thanks so much, Jeff. Great to be with you. Okay, thank Thanks. you. We'll see you soon. So Debbie, I want to build on what Matt just said because I, I'm showing this slide, which I think is absolutely critical um, because he talks about how um, over the course of a lifetime that um, the Labarts uh, degrees do pay off, right? And what I think is more important here is that we tend to think about um, when we talk about uh, things like economics and chemical engineering and electrical engineering, the things at the bottom here, we tend to talk about those students who end up, those graduates who end up in the 75th and 90th percentile, right? As opposed to more of the medians. And as you can see here in the middle, there's a lot more overlap mm. between you know, history and English and business and physics and accounting right, then we tend to think there is. Yes, if you end up at the top of the earnings uh, in computer science and electrical engineering, you're well above anybody in the humanities. Right? I'll give you that. But I think what's most important here is that not everybody ends up at the very top, right? Most right. people will end up in the median, right? They'll end up in the middle um, or in that 75th percentile. And as you can see there, over the course of your lifetime, there's a lot more overlap between majors than I think we give them credit for. And I think that's really important as, um, you know, as families look at uh, the ROI, particularly if you're looking at the earnings on the college scorecard, right? The US government college scorecard gives earnings data. It's important to remember those are earnings data for a couple of years out. They don't look necessarily at this lifetime value uh, of the degree like we see in other places, but it's very important to remember that, you know, just looking at one or two or three years out, yes, STEM and business majors are going to make more right out of the gate, as Matt mentioned. But over the course in our, the research that we did over the course of 10 years, the humanities majors catch up and over the course of a lifetime, they could earn as much or even out earn some STEM and business majors. And why is that? Because in many of the STEM and business majors, there are skills, going back to the skills discussion, there are skills that are going to kind of max out, right? And if you don't get additional training in education, you don't get a master's degree, you don't learn, for example, in computer science, new programming language, right? Or you don't keep up your skills in STEM and business, you are not going to necessarily get the better jobs that will supercharge your earnings throughout your lifetime. So it sounds like a great combination would be like um, philosophy engineering student, but. <laughs> yeah, and or, or I think of like history and statistics or history and uh, data visualization, right? Again, I, I think one of the things that we found, and, and I want to go back to something you, you set up the conversation with early on, is this idea of college major skills. And so many people, I saw people asking in the comments tonight, well, I have to go to a top 10 or top 20 university. Um, and there's two reasons why I don't think that's necessarily true. First of all, According to, I'm, I'm working on this for, for the new book, so Handshake, which is essentially LinkedIn for hiring at colleges and universities, right? They, they basically help colleges uh, get connected with employers, and that's how students find out about uh, jobs. 80% um, of their network of Fortune 500 companies recruit at 200 plus colleges and universities. 80% of the Fortune 500 companies 
on the on the on the handshake platform recruit at 200 or more colleges and universities. So this idea that college, uh, that some companies, and that's true, some companies do recruit only at a very small number of colleges and universities. I'm not going to deny that. But for most jobs and most employers, they are recruiting at a wide variety of colleges and universities, big publics, smaller publics, big privates, smaller privates, regional institutions, and national institutions overall. And what we found in our research is that Yes, selectivity matters of a college or university or a ranking of a college or university matters. Your major matters. So if you go and major in business or STEM at a highly ranked college, your outcomes are going to be better. But where a student who doesn't go to a selective college necessarily or doesn't major in STEM or business, where they can really start to catch up to those students who do is those skills that Matt was mentioning earlier. Right. If you get project management skills, if you get data analytics skills, things like that, the skills that are highly sought after in today's job market, if you're able to prove and have those skills, you will actually catch up to those students who are perceived to have a quote unquote better degree because of where they went and what they majored in. So, I mean, this is the basic question that always comes up and it's going to come up in the March, April timeframe is, you know, my student maybe got into a, a better school than, than, you know, they got into several schools. One obviously has a prestigious um, reputation. It costs so much more, you know, is it worth it? Should I spend the money? Should I borrow the money to send them to that quote, more prestigious school? Um, so no, with a caveat, right? Because essentially what you're buying at that more prestigious school is a network of people right? You're buying the alumni network and you're buying your peers. Um, and there is value on that. Um, if, by the way, you take advantage of that alumni network and peers, right? There are plenty of people who go to these highly selective schools. They never go to alumni events. They never go to networking events. They don't really engage with their classmates and they graduate four years later and they still can't find a job, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're not going to take advantage of that, then it's not worth it. But if you say, okay, I just can't afford this, or I don't want to go deep into debt, I want to go to this less selective institution. What can I do to kind of, again, catch up to those students at that more uh, selective place? And we know there are a, a set of practices that really matter. And that includes internships and not just one internship, but a selection of internships that start, you know, your, your first or second year of college that build on, on each other. Um, those are things that if you have those internships and students even at more selective colleges don't, uh, that's something that can uh, help. Uh, finding mentors among your faculty um, and, uh, and staff who can, again, help connect you with alumni that they know that can help you get into, um, into, the, into, the, into the job market. And then the third piece, so internships, mentors, and then getting these skills whether that's within you know, the institution itself or more likely, you will have to be a little bit more assertive uh, in this way, looking for uh, you know, getting that, uh, those skills, whether that's things like, I'm, and I'm just gonna throw some ideas out there. These are not just necessarily skills everybody ha needs to have, but things like um, you know, Salesforce or AWS or project management or things like that, like actual skills, as Matt said, where you're gonna get clues and job ads, if you could get those, that also allows you to be on par with those students from more selective colleges, who I, are, who, who I will argue may not even have that set of skills and they may be just helped by the network that they're part of. And of all the schools, I mean, you talk to so many, you know, people at different universities, do you see a lot of um, schools kind of sharing this information with students? I mean, I feel like this is great tonight as a parent, you can kind of go back and kind of now help shape your student, um, you know, course selection, what they try and do over the summer. But I feel just in my personal experience, I haven't seen this information come from colleges to um, help students kind of know what direction to go into. I mean, I think part of this, Debbie, is that colleges and universities for two, two things. One is they don't believe it's their job to get students a job. Um, that is just a, that's just a core belief of colleges and universities. It's changing. And there are some colleges and universities that have become much more aggressive and assertive about their career services offices. It's, 
It's something that, by the way, that I would be asking about on tours. I would be asking to go see uh, the career services office or whatever they might call it. I would ask specifically in my major that I'm thinking about, where have students interned uh, in the past year? Uh, tell me about those experiences and who got those internships? How did they get those internships? Are those internships available to first year students? Who's interned? Where have those students then gotten a job, right? I would ask a lot of questions about your major and career services and how, you know, are those regional companies? Are those national companies? If you're going away to college um, and you want to move to New York and you're going to college in California, how likely is that to happen, right? You know, what is the, the availability of the network? So no, to go back to your question, this is not something that colleges are, are telling students about because one, they don't believe it's their job to get students a job. And second, they believe that these skills that Matt was talking about earlier, right? Things like, let's put that, um, let me move back to that graphic I was showing uh, earlier. Um, so let's put this up, hold on one second. Um, so they believe a lot of these skills, right? Communication, collaboration, digital design, business prop. They believe a lot of these skills are embedded in their degrees, that they don't need to help students call them out, right? But students are very good about listing um, what they did, um, uh, you know, I, I had this summer internship and, and these were the activities I participated in, but not what they learned, whether that was in a particular class or um, a particular uh, uh, internship. So I'm very, for example, I'm very uh, uh, enamored with what, you know, everybody talks about Northeastern and their co-op. But one of the things that Northeastern has done is before, uh, before students go, before many students go on their co-op and after they come back, there are courses that they have done, uh, that they've designed at Northeastern, where before you go on your co-op, you talk about, okay, here are my goals. Here's what I wanna learn on my co-op, which is essentially a, a, an internship. And then after they come back, and this is even more critical, is they reflect on what they did and what they learned so that when they go for job interviews, they could talk specifically about communication. Um, or collaboration or these analytical skills, right? Because right now, colleges and universities think they are just embedded in the degree. And we have to help students kind of call these out, whether that's on their resume or whether that's in interviews. Well, how do I, you know, because an interviewer wants to know, well, how do you know this? Like, what have you done to show me that you can do this, right? Because so much of those first jobs is the ability to actually do the work. And they want to know that. And so I think that's one of the reasons why colleges just believe that, well, these skills are embedded in our degrees. But what I would encourage parents and students to think about is, well, how can I showcase those skills, whether those are in projects, in research, in internships, or, or whatever it might be? I have to say, I think you, in a good way, shocked people that, that by saying the phrase, colleges don't believe it's their role to get students a job. It isn't. It isn't. And it's a it's a shame. Right. Uh, again, I think that is. And that's, by the way, Debbie, particularly true, the further up the rankings you go. Right. The higher the ranked institutions, the less they think it's their job to get students a job because they feel like they can also coast on the historical value of their degrees. I will tell you, the schools that are hungrier, the schools that are going to help your kids get a job are actually lower ranked schools because again, they're trying to showcase their ROI to you. They will actually work, I think, harder, the fa individual faculty members, individual advisors, and the career center in general. And just a little tidbit, I don't know if you know, my daughter actually went to Northeastern and yeah. um, she graduated because of her co-op with a year and a half worth of experience, yeah. which was tremendous. Um, which even if you did summer jobs, you wouldn't get that amount. So, you know, for the schools, I wish more schools would be like a Northeastern and a Drexel. Any thought of of why they don't move in that direction? I mean, I think it's very hard to provide those professional opportunities like, you know, a Drexel and University of Cincinnati and Northeastern and others have built these incredible 
um, uh, uh, networks of employers that provide these co-ops um, to students. So just because you don't go to one of those doesn't mean you can't create those yourself. I think what is really critical, our internships are a critical key now in getting jobs. Because what happens is that they ladder, essentially internships are a ladder to a job. Um, and what's, or, or work in general. And so just to, right? to clear, when you say, in, you're talking about summer jobs, and I don't know if, if um, or, or it could, I mean. It could be a summer job. It could be a campus job. It could be work outside of the college, right? Um, where but explain a little bit more what, what you mean by laddering, because I'm not yeah. quite sure. So laddering could be, for example, uh, you could be your first year in college. You could get, um, there's a lot of these project-based uh, courses now where a company will work with a professor. Um, and this is something, by the way, again, to ask on your tours. If you're interested, if you're in the business school or you're in another school, ask them what kind of courses partner with companies and businesses. So it's happening now where a company like an Intel will work. I know this is happening at a number of different colleges. They will have a project that they need done and they will work with a professor. They will share data, they will share work and students in the course will work on that project over the course of a couple of weeks of the class, right? It's almost like a mini, mini internship without ever leaving campus. You get to do that your freshman year and then your sophomore year, you get an internship, by the way, using those skills you learned your freshman year. And then in your junior year, you get another internship. The key is though, when I say a ladder, you want to build, have those experiences build on each other, um, have, uh, you know, maybe you learn things in each internship about what you really want to do. And more importantly, what you don't want to do. I think internships are also critical where students kind of decide, hmm, I thought I wanted to major in this, or I thought I wanted to do this job. Now I see it every day, right? That could be job shadowing. I know the Stevens Institute of Technology does a lot of work freshman year with helping students shadow. Anyway, all these things build on because what's most important at the top of that ladder, Debbie, is your last internship mm -hmm. is critical in getting that first job. In other mm -hmm. words, uh, the work that the Michigan State has uh, done with employers has found out that 80% of big employers, so those are Fortune 500 companies, 80% of them hire from their intern pools. Mm. In other words, they, you know, you might be, if your kid's a senior in college, you might say, go to the career center and go find a job. In some companies and in some careers, those jobs are already gone. Right. Right. Those jobs have already been given to the interns that previous and it, like summer. they're given by the fall of senior yeah, year. They're given basically by the yeah. fall of, of senior year. And that's why that last internship is critical because if you prove yourself in those internships, you got a job. Okay. Let's switch just a tiny bit because the other piece of majors that I wanted to talk about is part of the admissions process. Um, there, I mean, and this ranges, you know, some schools ask students to declare a major as part of the application. In other schools, um, you know, you're actually picking like the sub school within the university to apply to. And there's not that much flexibility if you don't get in uh, um, as part of the initial application, it's hard to transfer in. So why do you think that's going on? There's, it feels like there's so much pressure um, to get that 17 year old to to declare a major as part of the admissions process when the point of going to college was to be able to explore all these things. Yeah, so a lot of this is around kind of capacity controlled, a very popular majors where there's only so much capacity on a, on a campus. And so they want students to declare. Um, true in a lot of the STEM majors, true in a lot of the business majors. Um, and it really is a shame because I agree with you that a lot of college is about trying to figure those um, things out. And I hear from parents all the time, my kid has no idea what they want to do, right? Um, and most people don't, you know, I'm 50 and I don't even sometimes know what I want to do, right? Like it takes a while for us to figure that out. And the other thing is that until you start to see what jobs are even available with that major, you may not like it. I remember a couple of books ago, uh, I interviewed an architecture major um, and it wasn't until he had an internship his junior year where he decided, I really don't want to be an architect, but he already had been through three years of that major and it was too late to switch at that point. Um, so it, it's unfortunate because that's the way it is right now with a lot of colleges 
with those capacity controlled majors. And if that's what you want to major in, you kind of have no choice but to declare that on the way. I mean, would you um, advise a student that who is truly undecided, I mean, to just maybe stay away from those schools that are kind of trying to, you know, you're saying, you know, capacity control, but kind of lock students in early on. Yeah, um, I would, I would, if you really don't know what you want to do, I would. and Because and, sometimes you know. people think like, oh, I'll just say I want to be, you know, go major in engineering or, or something or computer science just so I can get in that way. But that may not be really what I want to do. And that may not be what you want. So I don't, I don't encourage that because if you decide later on that that's what you want to do, it's hard to um, transfer internally. So I want to be totally open and honest with that because they're capacity controlled. It doesn't mean you could come in as an English major and then transfer to computer science your sophomore year at that school. You may have to go somewhere else. Um, but one of the things that's important to remember about some of these majors, and let's use computer science as a, an example. If you go to the college scorecard uh, for the U.S. government, so education department college scorecard, look up a major like computer science and look at a bunch of different colleges and universities. And one thing you're going to notice is that the salary outcomes of that major are pretty similar across a range of institutions. So that is a, there are a lot of these capacity control majors, which are in the STEM fields in particular, which to be honest with you, it almost doesn't matter where you go. You're going to actually get pretty good jobs because these skills and these majors are in such high demand. I'm curious. I what I've also seen a lot of recently, you know, kind of regardless of what your major is, but mainly mainly from the non-STEM um, majors, that they're adding on, honestly, like coding boot camps after they graduate, um, to kind of add that, um, you know, skill that they might not have gotten in college, or maybe they didn't realize they wanted it in college. Yeah, and in most cases, Debbie, you're also going to probably get a graduate degree over time. Um, and, and I think one of the things that Matt mentioned when he talked about that uh, BCG study, Boston Consulting Group study that he worked on, is that in some of the most popular majors um, or in the most popular degree fields uh, or disciplines or even job categories, so sales, uh, IT, uh, nursing, a bunch of other things, the skills are changing so quickly that you're probably, you know, this idea that you're going to get a bachelor's degree and be done um, is, is, is not, is not really the, is not going to happen, anymore, right? Like you're going to have to get either a master's degree or additional education later on. Now I know that's probably, there's probably a bunch of parents fainting right now because they're <laughs> thinking, I already have to figure out how to pay for undergraduate. I mean, the hope is here by this time, you know, your kids are working, uh, they're earning money. They may have an employer pay for some of this you know, down the road. Um, but this idea that your a bachelor's degree is going to be good enough for the rest of your life, I think is 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 from a different era. And I don't think that's going to be true. And it isn't true already um, uh, in the in the workplace that we're in already in today. Somebody made an interesting comment saying that they felt a mandatory gap year would solve a lot of these issues. Um, kind of it would people, because yeah. students would would be able to explore. And it's also how I think students should use their alumni network. I feel like students really don't know how to network. Um, and the alumni network is often used, well, they're going to help me get a job or get an internship. You know, there is nothing more than what people like to do than talk about themselves, right? Like if you have a chance to talk to somebody from your own, from the college you're in um, who is in the same major that you had, don't ask them for a job. Ask them to talk about their career journey. Ask them to talk about like, well, you left here. 20 years ago, what did you do? And what are some of the decisions you made? Like you, what you're looking for are what are those signposts that are important decision points in life about what you do next? Then talk to them about where they work now. What do they like about it? What don't they like about it? What are the skills that they think are important? I think what ends up happening, and Adam Grant at, at Wharton talks about this a lot, is that students use networking as a transaction, mm -hmm. right? They meet somebody, um, and they want to get their card and they want to ask them for a job or an internship. Don't waste your time doing that. You may be able to develop that relationship and ask them for that down the road. Get them to talk about their life, get them to talk about their career, get to them to talk about the skills they think are important. That's much more important than for what you need right now in, in college. No, that's great advice. Um, uh, I've seen students, I, I, I call it like re-engineering, re kind of where somebody, they look at LinkedIn, 
They see what somebody is doing and then look back at kind of how they got there. And I think that that's really valuable research for students to be doing. Hopefully that's somebody that maybe is in their alumni network, but it could be anybody. And you just have to see how they piece their career together. Great. Okay, just seeing if there's any some quick questions we can answer. There's been so many good uh, I know. conversations. The conversation tonight in the chat, I've been paying somewhat attention to it. It's been, it has, has, been, uh, has been great. So any other resources you can share with people just to kind of um, reiterate? Somebody just uh, asked again, um, maybe you can tell what the college scorecard yeah. is. If there's any other places that people could be looking at to get a sense of what you know expected salaries are for um, different occupations. Yeah, so I think the I think the college scorecard is a great resource um, because what it will show you is earnings by major program uh, a couple of years out, and every year they're adding more data to the college scorecard by college, right? So it allows you to say, okay, I'm going to major in, and I think this is really important especially at this time of year, right? Where you might have multiple acceptances, multiple um, financial aid packages, and you're comparing these colleges and in universities and you're saying, okay, I know I want to major in um, journalism. For example, I'm going to pick my, uh, my college major. Um, and I have acceptances from these four colleges. Go to the college scorecard, look up journalism or communications or whatever the broad major is, and you could see the earnings and the average debt um, for those students, uh, you know, two or three years out. And what you could do is then see, well, you know, what is the ROI on a degree from X university compared to Y university for this specific degree? And that helps bring that element into the balancing that you're doing between do I want to go into debt to go to this university? Um, and it also allows you to look at a specific major at those universities and say, you might find out at the end of the day, and this is very true among a lot of majors. You know what? There's these five colleges. Um, the, earnings out, the earnings outcomes of their students are, are pretty similar, right? There's not a lot of differences. And some of the times, by the way, Debbie, that's related to the region they're in, the city they're in, and things like that, and where most of their graduates go. But I think that's an important element to bring in, especially at this time of year or in the months we're about to hit right now, where you're weighing multiple offers at the same time. Okay, one last question this is actually an interesting comment. And this is kind of goes contrary to a lot of what we talked about tonight. But somebody's saying, um, should we be buying a la carte um, to acquire these variety of skills? Like basically, do we even need to send our kids to college or can we yes. be piecing these things together for them? No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I don't, I would not recommend a la carte, uh, because at the end of the day, and I think this goes back to the very first slide that Matt and I showed about the value of the degree, the value of the degree as a kind of table stakes, as a, as Matt always calls it an entry ticket, right? Is It is your ticket into the job market and then once you're there, you have all these other skills that you've acquired that kind of, you know, um, speed you ahead, right? And so uh, I, you know, if employers have the option between somebody with a degree and somebody with just a bunch of badges or credentials, they're going to pick the student with the degree because the degree to them is still a signal of, of, of soft skills, of discipline, of completing something. I mean, the degree is getting a lot of, it's right now, right? There's a lot of complaints about the college degree, but it's still a proxy for a lot of employers in terms of when they hire, right? Matt talked about some research that he's about to come out with, right? We see all of these reports, right, of, of employers advertising jobs without degree requirements. And we know those job ads are way up, but when you look at how many employers are actually hiring people without degrees, it's pretty small. It's pretty small. So that degree plus those skills and credentials and things like that are important. Um, but the degree is kind of the foundation of that. Okay, one well, last good question. So somebody is saying, if colleges don't believe they should be getting a job, then how 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 do you think that they measure their success? <laughs> <laughs> well, they measure their success in students like graduating. Uh, you know, so graduation rates are in retention. Are, are a sign of success. 
and students getting a job and um and and obviously making money and hopefully donating money back is is critical to them but they don't think it's their job to get students a job they think it's up to the students to get a job right they will give students the tools they will give students the education to go get that job but they don't feel like they need to put the infrastructure in place necessarily to help them get a job. That's changing. That attitude is changing. And as I said earlier, it's definitely already changed at lower rank schools. As we move up the rankings, there is a, still a lot of opposition among the faculty to this careerism that has really entered the conversation about the college degree. But I'm sorry, when a college degree exactly, at a yeah. private university sticker price, and I understand this is a sticker price, sixty, seventy thousand dollars all in in four years, you know, hey, I want something for that, right? I'm not, I'm just, I'm not just taking a flyer on the fact that my kid might get a job from this institution. Okay. Any other questions that you see, Jeff? That uh, you want to? Address? No, I, I think there's been so many uh, good, uh, good questions. And actually, questions. yeah. If I'm gonna actually, um you know, take, take a copy of these comments. Cause I see a lot of good advice from professionals in here or people who are tech reporter or tech recruiters. And I'm going to summarize it. Cause I think there's what people are just sharing in the chat is great um, for other people to, to know as well. So thank you for putting these comments in yep. and um, thank you, Jeff. This was great. I really hope that um, parents can take away this information and um and guide their students. I hope colleges start to share more of this information. I really appreciate you and Matt putting this information out there. And so if I, actually, if anybody wants to read some of the reports that you wrote, the, to yeah, download- They just go to my website, website. jeffsalingo.com, and, uh, and you can download uh, this paper uh, in particular, which was about making the bachelor's degree uh, more valuable. Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and uh, see you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Have a good one. Bye-bye.